Today we're doing chest tubes. One thing I want you to keep in mind, everything we did yesterday and this morning is testable material. You can expect questions on the first exam about yesterday and what we did this morning. And for Schulenberg, we're talking about medication, correct medication administration, or med giving meds correctly. So obviously this afternoon is the first PowerPoint lecture, and obviously there will be PowerPoint questions um, also, or questions on chest tubes. What's kind of interesting, this is kind of the first time we've done this, um, where, what happened there? Let's go back. I like it. Excuse us while we try to fix this thing up here. I had that. I'm just trying to make this where I had it, where I thought it was going to go. Okay. Uh, thank you. Whoever's in the audience helping me, I appreciate that. Uh, chest tubes. Um, I, again, I hope everyone came prepared. Uh, what's interesting, what I was getting ready to say was, everyone within the sound of my voice has probably been heard me lecture. I don't know if that's good or bad, but usually, many of the genetic students, this is the first time they've been to a lecture from Mrs. Conley or myself. And uh, since Mrs. Conley and I both helped Miss Lois in the spring, I know that uh, I lectured for you, so you know that I say things that aren't funny, but I come in a little bit. Um, I like to think that I'm enthusiastic. Uh, I try not to read from the slides. I, and I write good questions, I think, for exams, from my perspective. They may not be good questions from your perspective, but from my perspective, they are uh, halfway decent. So does Mrs. Conley. Chest tubes, what are we talking about? Let's find out. What kind of client gets a chest tube? People for different disease states will be, would, would need a chest tube. Traumatic injuries. Um, surgery. Uh, if someone was doing a surgery in the thoracic cavity for some reason, that will cause, as we get to the uh, pathophysiology behind this, a collapsed lung, and the chest tube will put in place to reinflate that lung. And the iatrogenic causes. What, are, what does iatrogenic mean? That is an I, not a, a capital I, not a little L. I hear that, but I hear no answer. Iatrogenic means it's an unfavorable response to a medical or surgical procedure. It is an unfavorable response to the appropriate uh, surgical intervention or medical intervention. So it's usually, hot because we think about in our case, the client came in the hospital without this problem. We treated them appropriately, and now they developed another problem. And a collapsed lung could be an iatrogenic uh, uh, result of appropriate treatment. Specifically, what is happening with those different issues, indications, is what happens, the client develops a pneumothorax, or a tension pneumothorax, or a hemothorax, or empyea. If, if a client has one of those or a combination of those problems, then they uh, potentially will require a chest tube. Now, pneumothorax, proper name, you'll hear the nursing staff or the surgeon say, oh, the client's got a pneumo. That's short, not sh short for pneumonia, but short for pneumothorax in my experience. Um, let me tell you what each one of these are. Pneumo, you remember your Latin? This means there's air in the thoracic cavity instead of lung tissue. Hemothorax is blood 
fit in the thoracic cavity. Emo, pneumo is a combination of both air and blood. Empyema is purulent fluid that's collected for whatever reason in the thoracic cavity. Pleural effusion is non purulent fluid. It shouldn't be there and in that quantity, and it causes problems, but it's not um, purulent, meaning pus or from an abscess or something like that. And then hydrothorax is uh, a non inflammatory fluid. And I've actually never in my 30 years had a client with hydrothorax. I've had the others though. Um, you. What can happen when you say non-inflammatory? Sometimes we um, purposely inject something into the pleural space. Chemotherapy drugs, sclerosing agents, and a sclerosing agent is something that's a little, for lack of a more appropriate term, corrosive. But what it does, it causes scar tissue. What we're trying to do is get the pleura of the lung tissue to stick to the pleura of the thoracic wall. Does that make sense? But we can purposely put an irritant in there. In fact, we'll use, I'm pretty sure they use talcum powder. Obviously, it's a, um, uh, not talcum powder that you buy foot powder at the store. But it's that kind of stuff that's an irritant, irritant, irritant and then it causes a little bit of scar tissue, causes the tissue to stick like we want it to. I'll get more of that in a moment. Uh, why do we give the client a chest tube? Well, if we need to remove air, if we need to remove some of this fluid, or remove blood from that pleural space, this is the way we get it out of the body. Why is not going to absorb it, or if they absorb it, it's going to take way too long. And uh, if I have a lung that's been displaced by air or fluid or blood, can that blood fully hydrate? Can it fully participate in gas exchange? No, it cannot. So we put the chest tube in to remove this so that, again, that lung can take part in gas exchange. Uh, we, we're going to talk about uh, the uh, physiology behind this, but we breathe using negative pressure. And what we're doing here is restoring that negative pressure. We'll talk about that in the back. It re-expands that collapsed lung. If I, can people live? with one lung? Yes, they can. Can they run a mile as fast as they used to with one lung? No, they can't. So anytime someone has a collapsed lung, until their body got used to it, you usually have some respiratory distress, and go to relieve that by re-expanding that lung. And it, obviously, by re-expanding the lung, the ventilation takes place, the fusion of the lung takes place, and uh, that's going to be helpful, obviously. Let's talk a little bit about anatomy. Uh, typically, we'll review, uh, we have three compartments. Those three compartments are right lung, left lung, and the mediastinum. And the mediastinum is that. It's the middle. It's the media, which is the middle part of the lung. And inside the mediastinum are the great vessels. I'm talking about the pulmonary artery and veins. And the greatest vessel, vessel, the aorta. And it's also where the heart resides, essentially. Okay. And then you have your right lung. How many lobes on the right side? Three. How many lobes on the left side? Two. So we have five total lobes uh, using both lungs. The, you know what visceral is or viscera? So we have two pores. That's the, that's the, uh, the membrane and the visceral uh, pleura surrounds the lung tissue itself, and the parietal pleura is what's on the inside wall. You know, you got skin, tissue, muscle, ribs, and you go on the other side, but before you get into the chest wall, the chest cavity itself, the, the uh, parietal pleura lines inside of the chest wall, okay? Full space, that's the name but it's what we refer to as a potential space, okay? There is space there, and it's fluid filled, but what happens when you were in microbiology, when you put a teeny tiny drop of water on two glass slides, on one glass slide, and you put the other glass slide on top of it, did they stick? 
Okay. So the pore space has a little teeny tiny bit of fluid that's supposed to be there to help those things to increase the surface tension so the uh, visceral pore is stuck to the parietal pore. Make sense? Any questions about that? I want to give you normal and then tell you what the problem is. The, uh, the, uh, this plural space, uh, I told you, has them to adhere to each other, and also because there's some fluid there, it allows it to slide a little bit. Okay? So I can take two slides that are moist, and they slide, it's just hard to pull them apart, right? So keep that in mind on what we're doing, or how the run runs are supposed to work. Okay. Mechanics of breathing. I see no one with an airway, artificial airway, on a ventilator. So everyone who can hear me, I'm going to make a giant assumption that we're all breathing the same way, and we breathe using negative pressure. What happens is the diaphragm contracts and flops. The chest wall expands, and that creates a negative pressure that draws air into our lungs. That's normal breathing for inspiration. When someone is on a ventilator, when I give this lecture, we force air into their lungs using positive pressure to expand the lungs. That's not normal. That's why we breathe with people who are using a bag, mask, valve system, and or they're on a uh, ventilator. Uh, Something to keep in mind, the thorax and the lungs basically exist as opposing forces. What do I mean by that? The natural state of the lungs is in a state of collapse. If we just took a pair of lungs and looked at them. They're not wide open and ready to go. They're squished up. That's the natural state. The natural state of the thorax is expansion. By opposing forces. Okay. So then you see that what's really important for normal breathing is that the pleura, the pleural space, has very little fluid, a wide amount of fluid, not too much, not too little, just right, and no air or anything else in that space. Because the tendency is for the thorax to expand and the lungs to collapse. And so that flow of space is very important to maintain uh, lung expansion. This is a picture giving you some general anatomy. Uh, the book you bought, I think, had these slides. What you downloaded that was a small file did not have the pictures, but I gave you the picture, the slide, slides with the picture, because sometimes I have people who are, uh, have a dial-up and they just couldn't get these pictures. It's a big old file. It takes forever to, uh, to come in. Uh, <clears throat> what we have here, you can, if you can't see it, I, I, uh, this is part of the spine up here. Here's the clavicle. Scapula is a shadow back here. Uh, how, do you, how many lectures, how many hours have you spent on radiology 101? Probably zero. Do, is it a, are you going to be given a x-ray on the NCLEX and you have to get it right? No, that's beyond our scope of practice. How do you learn about x-rays? You make the physician tell you about it when they're on the floor with your client. So they can show you where the fracture is, where they can show you where the pneumonia is, and then you get used to, because this is all what's normal and then what's abnormal for the client. Um, we talked about the mediastinum. This is the outside of the lung field. The mediastinum is the middle third. So how we decide if a client has a widened mediastinum is that this is outside these barriers as we look for heart shadows and things. You'll see people who have what we call affectionately, not really, a big floppy heart. But this heart muscle will be out here like this. They, when they have cardiomegaly or they failure, they have a big heart that's inefficient. So you're looking at what is normal with the middle third, the mediastinum, and you're looking at that area. Um, 
Remember that air is black. So how come this is not all black? Because the lungs have vessels, vasculature. And so say, well, the, the lung is full of air, it should be black. No. Lungs should look like this. I'm going to show you lungs that aren't even inflated. That's why you see all the black. Okay? looks like it's a little off right here. I don't know for sure. A little wide there. Here's what you can't... Oh, I need to go back. So look at a normal... The really normal those lungs have fluid in them. You're looking at this area at the very bottom. In fact, I can't tell you how many times I've experienced doctors to send the patient back to x-ray because they can't visualize these areas right here. Because if you notice, this is where the diaphragm comes all the way down and you really can't see the very bottom on either one of these. But it's pretty darn close. Uh, that's where fluid is going to collect because of gravity. Someone stands up for a check sex right and there's fluid in their lungs. Isn't this going to fill up right here? See what I mean? Huh? It will look more like this. That's correct. Normal, when, it, when we want it to look right, it has this nice curve. Okay? And you can see the point of the rib, the thorax itself, and the bottom of the diaphragm that looks something like this. We're talking about down here. Okay? Just the way it looks. That's how we look for fluid in the lungs. Um, here, uh, can you see how dark that is compared to this? Okay? Well, the reason that's dark is I'm going to outline the actual lung tissue on this particular x-ray. That's the client's right lung. Okay? Now, I outlined it, but if you were able to look at this clearly, you can see that. But the first time I look at x-rays, I have no clue. When the doctor says, you see that? You go, yeah. But you don't notice the first time because you're not used to reading x-rays. Okay? It comes with practice. Am I going to give you an x-ray on the exam? No. I'm just trying to talk about what it looks like. Okay? New authority. Let's talk about these different, um, different conditions. Remember, new authority is air or gas uh, in the plural space. What's normal is no pressure, a negative pressure, between the visceral and, and a vital pleura. But in this particular case, for some reason, some injury, we have air or gas that is entered into the pleural space, creating a positive pressure which prevents the lungs from adhering and be completely open. That last bullet says air in the pleural space increases the intrapleural pressure and leads to a partial and or total collapse of the lung. When I say partial, what we typically see from the ER or wherever this happened uh, they have a simple pneumothorax, less than 15%. And what they're saying is, in their guesstimation, 85% of the lung is still open and being ventilated. The class is 15% less. And why that number is important, I've had ER doctors tell me, anywhere from 10 to 15, no chest tubes necessary. We're going to watch the client and see if, they, if this resolves on its own. Okay? A medium pneumo is about 15 to 60, and a large pneumo thorax is greater than 60, obviously. Just if you hear those terms, if you read them in the medical record, that's what they're talking about. When you have a pneumo, air or gas, it can be simple, traumatic, or tension. Those are the different types. A simple one is just that. There's a glass. Um, I've had clients who were doing absolutely nothing and over a period of a few hours felt this, meaning they had that air hunger. They couldn't catch their breath. 
They had no pain. They got a little restless. Got a little air hunger. They were in their 20s. And they said, I don't know what's wrong. I better go to the doctor. Do an x-ray. They have a partially collapsed lung. <laughs> so that can happen. We could have like an aneurysm, if you think about uh, the blood vessel, it's actually a bleb. We can have weakness in our lung tissue that air is supposed to be within side, but it could escape outside the lung tissue into the pleural space. Most of the time, a simple pneumothorax, someone gets bumped, not hard, not with a baseball bat, and causes a collapsed lung. So you can have some trauma involved. Actually, I have that on the slide on it. You can have some trauma. I've had clients who were fell, and this would be the 1,200th time they fell in their lifetime, and this time they did great on the uh, floor. And then tension. We're going to talk about tension in a moment. Here's your new lobe. Woo! And here's blood or fluid in the pleural space. And there's both of them. So that was my only fancy graphic I'm going to do. Simple is a closed or spontaneous. And we have air getting to that pleural space I've been talking about. And no, with no disease state that can be related to cause this. This is because the person's a man. Thank goodness, I guess. Uh, ages 20 to 40. And that small blister or bleb can open. And do I talk about blunt trauma, rib fracture? The iatrogenic cause could be PEEP. Anyone knows what PEEP stands for? Yes, that's part of a nursery rhyme, little bow PEEP. That's not what I'm talking about here. PEEP stands for positive end expiratory pressure. PEEP is, some, is a setting that we add to the ventilator that during and after exhalation, a little bit of pressure is maintained to keep the alveoli open. Uh, typically, if we have a simple pneumothorax as a result of some known trauma, or the client does have a disease state, then we call it a complicated simple pneumothorax or a secondary uh, simple pneumothorax. The client will be dysmic, and dysmic means air hunger. Is dyspnea a sign or a symptom, subjective or objective? It is a symptom and it is subjective. The client says, I don't feel like I can catch my breath, right? That's dyspnea. Uh, they can have complaints of shortness of breath. They can have some chest pain. We may, we may hear decreased breath sounds in the area of the lung that has collapsed. We may hear no breath sounds at all. Do you remember when you learned in assessment to do the stay behind the client and have them take a deep breath? You may have some, a that's when you're going to potentially see some asymmetrical breathing as they are breathing and you're observing them. Traumatic. Traumatic means something entered into the chest cavity causing that lung to collapse. So there's a hole in the chest wall. And now environmental or atmospheric air has entered into the pleural space. Air in the pleural space, what we said before, same bullet, increases the intrapleural pressure, leads to a partial or total collapse of that lung. Uh, so a penetrating injury, it can be a knife, it can be a bullet, it can be a splinter, big splinter, I guess, okay? Also, it can be a, something that occurred, uh, yesterday I, told, I showed you uh, chest or chest with the CVP line, to the line. Well, when the physician is putting in a subclavian central venous catheter, I don't know if you know how, the, how that's done. It's all done by landmarks. You can't see the subclavian. You can't put a tourniquet to make the subclavian occur. So basically it's landmarks, and they actually put this big needle right in the clavicle, and then march that 
watch that needle under the clavicle and right on the other side of the clavicle is the subclavian vein. Right in the subclavian vein is the lung tissue. And so you can cause a traumatic simple pneumothorax by getting in a putting in a central line. I'm not going to put in a central line. I don't have to worry about it. Put the right client. That's one reason why we get a chest x-ray right after a central line is put in. But the same thing happens with an IJ. They can, they can nick a lung putting an IJ in. Um, assessment. When we have a traumatic or a hole in the chest wall, you might be able to hear a sucking, what we call a sucking chest wound. Because the client's still breathing, you hope. Otherwise, you got other higher priorities. So you have a sucking chest sound on inspiration as the chest wall rises. And depending on the severity and how long it's lasted, varying degrees of respiratory distress noticed by the client. Sub Q emphysema can occur, and I'll talk about that later, in case you don't know what that is. Simple, traumatic, and now we have tension. A tension pneumothorax, it's all still with air. Air comes into the pleural space on inspiration, but does not leave on expiration. So, I take a breath, air is trapped. I exhale. I take a breath. What happens? More air comes in and is trapped when I exhale. I take another breath. See the problem? I have more air coming into that side. Why do you think we have you look for a deviated trachea on assessment? Because with all this air coming on this side, all this air coming in on this side, it actually pushes all the greater vessels in the heart up to and including the trachea to the opposite side of the injury. That's what the second bullet says. With each inspiration, more air is trapped. You get an increase in the thoracic pressure, which just pushes the heart, the vena cava, the aorta, aorta out of position, the trachea, and you get what we call a mediastinal shift to the uninjured side. This is considered a medical emergency. And when you take ACLS, you get the secret on how to fix it. I'll tell you a moment. I'm going to keep it secret too, secret too long. If I increase pressure in my thoracic cavity and I'm squeezing the heart and the superior vena cava, is blood going to drain from my head into the heart like it should? You see why my jugular veins will become distended? Because all this pressure down here. Well, it's draining from the brain, but it's not going into the heart like it should because of this pressure. Dyspnea, um, a deviated trachea to the opposite side of the injury, and <clears throat> distant because the heart's being pushed away, and um, distant, and you know this air, distant heart sounds. Uh, we may see subcutaneous emphysema, absent breath sounds, cyanosis, hypotension, and tachycardia. And the treatment is an 18 gauge needle inserted into the second intercostal space mid curricular line. That is cool because you save the client's life. 18 gauge, one and a half inch needle, second intercostal space mid curricular line, and it's like letting the air out of the tire because you've got all that trapped air. Okay? So here's kind of a graphic representation. The top one, I know the picture is in the way, but air is going in and air is coming out on inspiration and expiration with an open pneumothorax. With a tension, what usually happens is we have a flap that's on the inside. So when I breathe, when I inspire, air is drawn in, but when I expire, the flap closes and the air is trapped inside that space. And obviously, like the slide shows, the more air, the more it pushes. Heart, greater vessels, trachea, everything to the other side. Um, this is an x-ray of a pipe with a tension pneumothorax. 
Let's see if we remember how our, our heart shadow should look. Shouldn't it be like this? Shouldn't it be kind of like this? And what it's actually doing, do you see this shadow right here? Pushing it, the injured lung, it tells you up here, is right here. And air keeps coming into this space right here, pushing everything to the other side. Eventually, the person dies because they can't. They we're squeezing, we're squeezing the other lung. They can't breathe. They can't have any gas exchange. They die. How long? Here I'm only going to start with it depends. <laughs> depends on the degree of the opening and how much air is being inspired every single time. It's not a long period of time, but you can have a small tension you will relax. You're not bringing in that much air every time. Okay? So the answer is second intercostal space. Make it in green. Mid clavicular line. Is it, are you going to hit lung tissue? No. Are you going to hit the aorta? No. Then push to the other side. Do they need a chest tube afterwards? Yes. They got to go to the emergency room? Yes. Hemothorax. Talked about air. This is blood. Chest trauma, cancers, tears in the lining, Excess, excessive anticoagulation therapy, their PTINR skyrockets, their PTT skyrockets. They can start bleeding internally. Okay? Post thoracic surgery and open lung biopsy going in and thinking they may have uh, some cancer, seeing something on the x ray, and need to go in and do a biopsy. Oh. If we're going to do a medical intervention that is going to cause a, a, a pneumothorax or a hemothorax, the chest tube is going to be what we expect afterwards. They're going to have a chest tube. That's the therapy after we surgically enter into the thoracic cavity. With blood or hemothor uh, hemothorax, client's anxious, decreased rats and breath sounds, or, or depending on how much bleeding there is, can you see where they can be pale? Can you see where the H and H would drop? If this was unbeknownst stuff that they were bleeding. Um, all the same problems of the pneumothorax as far as shortness of breath, uh, dyspnea, uh, rapid heart rate, rapid uh, uh, respirations. But in this case, they may have a rapid heart rate compensating for the hypovolemic shock they're going into. There's a losing blood volume. Hypotension, dropping of blood, pressure, flat neck veins. We haven't already talked about that. So the treatment is, for someone who knows how to do this, put it on a chest tube. Well, okay, good, good question. Where are crackles when you listen to it? Inside the lung. Blood now has occupied the space where those lungs would be. We're not saying there's blood. This is not pulmonary edema. Fluid in the lung tissue itself. This is fluid between the lung tissue and the chest wall. So you're not going to hear that. Yes, percussion changes, absolutely. Uh, and breath sounds change because the lung doesn't expand. You hear accent breath sounds are diminished versus crackles or lung higher like that. Okay, question? Uh, this is a picture. Remember I talked about this person has a large heart. Uh, you see this little, what well, I was talking to you about before, those corners, blue with fluid. Anything over here? This is actually all fluid in that lung field. Okay? And they're saying that this is a hemothorax with blood, but you can't look at the x-ray and say it's blood. So I wasn't there. This is, I've been told this is a hemothorax, but this is fluid uh, occupying that space. Same thing over here. You see a little bit of a shadow here. It goes down right about there. A little, little hard to see there, but definitely nothing in this space right here. You agree?
So this is a uh, left hemothorax, and the other one was a right hemothorax. So hemonumo, both air and blood. This is the little space. And it's two chest tubes. You, you put a chest tube, typically, if the chest tube is low, is to remove fluid, whether it's blood or whatever else, non purulent or empyema. But a low chest tube is for fluid, obviously for gravity. And a high chest tube is typically for air, again, obviously for gravity. Okay? One of my students a few semesters ago had a client. She had high chest tube. One for each lobe. Yeah. Firstly, I was like, that's interesting. And the next week, she was still in the hospital, and another student of mine had her. And I remember them walking down the hallway. She had two water sealed drainage systems, we'll talk about later, on her, on her IV stand. She was walking down the hallway and said, that's just amazing. Just amazing. Empyema, purely excitate in the pleural space. So it can be due to pneumonia, TB, an abscess, which is what? A pus filled area of, of some tissue, right? Uh, esophageal rupture, penetrating, penetrating chest wound that hasn't been treated correctly. You know, they never went to the doctor or whatever, I don't know, or they just develop an infection. So empyema is byproduct the body's natural state to pissing itself. Then you know what pus is, that's the breakdown of white blood cells doing their job, right? So that's what this is. What we will find, like everything else, basically rapid heart, or excuse me, rapid respiration, dyspnea, uh, decreased breath sounds, you could hear some, uh, when you have a plural friction rub, the uh, fluid that's supposed to be in the plural space, naturally, again, I told you it allows things to slide. When things aren't sliding right, you can hear a, a rubbing sound, you have a grating sound, very interesting. Uh, and, and if you haven't heard that or been in a long time, find in full friction rub on Google, and it'll send you the site to go right there. Right there. Restlessness, localized chest pain, tachycardia. Treatment, chest tube, and if something to treat the infection that's causing the pus to be born, correct? Let's take a break. And uh, when we come back from break, we'll start on this particular slide. And we're back on record. Um, what do we need? Someone has a pneumothorax, a tension pneumothorax. Uh, we are going to have to put in a chest tube. The, the word chest tube is what you will hear. Technically, it's a thoracostomy tube. When you think about it, where is this? What's, a, what's an ostomy? An opening. And this is an opening in the thorax. And we're actually putting in this uh, tube into that opening. And I'll explain it a little bit more. Let me show you. Let me hold up a chest tube. This is a brand name. It comes in. You talk about something that's kind of large. Uh, this is not the tube. This is the container it's in. Here's a container that's sealed, and this one says it is a 36 French, so it's on the system as uh, Foley catheters are in. They're not gauges, they're Frenches. I'll tell you about it. This is a 24 French, so you take the top off, and this is a sterile tube. Uh, I'm not going to pass this around. I'll tell you why. I may, but I'm going to take the sharp, pointy thing out of it, <laughs> which is this thing. And this is just like an IV catheter. This is the part that goes into to make room for this more flexible tube itself. Does that make sense? So this is the stylet. This is the needle, like an IV catheter. And yes, it's sharp and pointy, and it hurts really bad. So I'll remove this large knitting needle. <laughs> and I will pass around a small 24 French thoracostomy tube. 
This is a small, this is more like a real small person or a, a child size. Mm -hmm. Is the patient a predator or are they just dead? The question is, is a client put under? No, the client is awake many times. And it looks really, really, really painful. I've watched people, surgeons, doctors in the ER put this in. And not only does it look painful, the physician who's doing it struggles. If you've never seen it, I had this, the first time I saw it, I could not believe how much exertion the doctor was doing putting this thing in. I figure, IV, poke a hole, put it in, no big deal. No, they struggled and struggled and struggled. And part of it is, you just can't imagine how tough your intercostal muscles are. They're tough. And what they're trying to do is get this tube, and, and if they're going in a place where the wall hasn't separated, they've got to use blunt dissection, and typically a finger is what's used, because they don't want to pierce any tissue that's there, and so they're trying to run up the wall and blunt dissect in order to get the... Um, of the chest tube in correctly. Okay. Is there a local anesthetic? Yes, there is a local. If, if, if they don't like the client, <laughs> they give them a leather strap or a bullet. <laughs> if they like the client, they do a local anesthetic. No, they're going to do an incision. They're going to use a scalpel, a blade, and they're going to, they're going to, but it still seems difficult. Okay. Um, these things are made so that they are less likely to have clots form on them, the body's natural response to a foreign object inside. Uh, they are marked. They have a line on them that will show up as radiopaque, meaning that on x-ray you'll see it. It has marks on them, so we know when the doctor's done, how far it's in, so that next day we want it to be just as far unless we expect something to pull out a little bit, okay, unless it comes out by accident. Um, and the marker is so that we can see it on the x-ray. And yes, there are a variety of sizes. They vary, they vary from 20 French to about 42 French, is what the, pardon? Okay. Why would you want a real big one? You get the blood and clots out, right? Air, no big deal. You've got fluid, you've got to have the holes big enough to get those, that blood clots out, which could happen. Uh, what do you need if you are the nurse? And the doctor says, Quick, we're going to put a chest tube in your patient in room whatever. And you're going to go, what do I need? And they're going to say, what kind of nurse are you? And you go, I'm a new nurse. What do I need? <laughs> so, does everyone need to be a gown, glove, mask? Yes. Okay. Surgeons, uh, whoever's doing it, they have to be a surgeon, uh, and anyone who is assisting. Should you get some betadine or whatever you're using to cleanse the skin? Because this is done in the bed in the client's room. Maybe. If it's in the evening and there's an on-call OR, OR team and they're not in a hurry and they're not going to take them down to the OR, okay. But these are done in the emergency room on the gurney, in the room, in the client's regular mid-surgery room. Uh, local anesthetic, yes. <laughs> Scalpel, yes. Hemostat, yes, to clamp off the tube. Suture material, because they do suture the tube to the skin so it doesn't get pulled out by accident. Petroleum gauze, yes. The petroleum gauze is to make an airtight seal. Remember, I, now I've put a hole in the client's chest wall. I have to seal that so air doesn't leak in or out. Mostly important in. Still so con connecting tubing. Tubing from the tube itself is being passed around. Sorry, Schulenberg, uh, but you can't really see this. I'd be glad to demonstrate it more closely on the, uh, the camera I have up here. Um, but we have the spittle tubing going from the tube that's in the client's body to the drainage system. Speaking of the drainage system, we have a drainage system. Uh, if we're going to use vacuum, we need a source of suction and tape. And typically, we use the old, classic, really adhesively good sticky, sticky tape that once you put it on, you're never going to be able to get it off. <laughs> if most units, most units will have a, a, a chest tube tray on the floor 
in the supply room. Hopefully, they uh, don't. In the supply room, which is when the doctor says, we're going to put a chest tube in, you're going to go, I'll go get the chest tube tray. Okay? Uh, this is a particular kit from a particular. It, has, it does not. Typically, it does not have the chest tube. That's a separate item because they come in a variety of sizes and the doctor is certain. The doctor tells you what size they want you to get. And you grab the tube that was passed around separately, get the kit, and that's the contents of the kit. And basically the things I talk about are in there. And when I was talking about it, it's not on the, it, the slide. It, that, those, those items were on that slide that wasn't on the screen when, I, when you had me. Uh, and besides the kit, you need the chest tube tray itself. Sorry, the water sealed drainage system. This is a brand name, Atrium. Atrium is a brand name. The most common brand name in my experience is a Pluravac. Pluravac is a brand name. It's actually a closed water sealed chest drainage system would be the technical term. And in this particular case, I have a live one. This is what we're talking about. And you have a picture of the Atrium from the company Ocean, I guess, right there in your textbook on um, seven hundred something. I'll tell you when I get to the slide what page it's on. Okay? And I actually cannot turn this. This is filled with fluid on purpose. Okay, it's really hard for me to, because this is like the mirror image. If I want to go that way, I have to go this way. Um, this is the same thing that was in that package. I just want, here's what I want to show you right now. Oops. This is the drainage collection chamber. So it's the collection chamber. This right here in the middle is the water sealed chamber. <laughs> And this is the, oh, shit, I can't, mirror in the It really weird me out. <laughs> this, this is the suction control chamber. So keep those three in mind. You'll hear them again. I just want you to see that this would be compatible or comparable to a three-bottle system. And when we're talking about bottles, one at a time, to show you what each of these different chambers are doing, okay? <laughs> um, <clears throat> Three-chamber unit, we're using a source of vacuum on the wall to restore the negative pressure, which is what, how we already told you, the lungs naturally work if they open and we breathe. The drainage system is there to uh, remove the air, fluid, and or blood, or whatever we, why the, why the client's getting this chest tube. <clears throat> it uses a one-way mechanism. And that one-way mechanism, mechanism is the water seal, sealed chamber. I need you to think, and you'll see a slide on this later. If I have a glass of water, and I put a straw in that glass of water, is it possible for air to go up the sides of the glass, go down the inside of the glass, through the water, and back up through that straw? That would be impossible, correct? So that's the principle of the water sealed chamber. It prevents air from the environment to go back to the client through the tubing. So air prevents air from the environment going back. We'll talk a little bit more about that. I believe this is the picture on page 762 in your textbook. And now is the time to take the plastic off your textbook. <laughs> um, the one on the left is, in my experience, much more common in the clinical setting. This is the one that I showed you. This is the collection chamber. 
This is the water sealed chamber, and this is the suction control chamber. And they do exactly what they say. So I should say drainage collection chamber if you want three initials. Uh, if I'm removing fluid or blood, it you can't tell. See this right here? That's the Christmas tree connection, the adapter, that's going to go on the end of that chest tube that's inside the client's body. And you can't see this, but this tubing, if I could draw it behind, is actually right there. Okay? And so this is going to go to the client. Does that make sense? And so any fluid that's removed from the client is going to start right here and start filling this up. And these things actually hold about two liters or more. So you don't change the drainage system every eight hours. Because if the client bleeds out 2,000 mLs every eight hours, the client has serious other issues besides their chest tube. So these are made to have two liters worth of fluid because they last usually the whole time the client needs a chest tube. Usually. We can change them out, but usually they last the whole time. Um, how we document the output is interesting because if I, at, at the end of the first shift, I'm going home, and I'll write 3 September at, uh, I'm going home at 7 o'clock, at 18.30. Next morning when the nurse is off, they're going to come over and go right, right here, 06.30 for September. Does that make sense? So we don't drain this, we just continue to mark and then do the math. We are at 80, the next shift is 140, the client had 60 mLs out that particular shift. This is the water sealed chamber. And let me go a little bit further. What's interesting about this one here, that I'm going to highlight in green, this is a the suction control chamber doesn't have any fluid in it. It's dialed in. It's, it, this is a dry system here on the right. We'll talk about this is more common, the one on the left. But you see these feet at the bottom? The big issue with these things is when they get tipped over, we mess the whole system up. So they hang from the bed, and when they're on the ground, Accidents happen. The biggest accident is when this thing's hanging on the bed, and you in the bed you lower the bed, and it gets crushed by the bed as you're going down. It's funny, so unless it's you and your patient, then it's not funny. Uh, let's talk about the water seal chamber. Put your straw. This is a single bottle system. In this particular case, if we were using a single bottle bottle system, this would be a combination. <clears throat> collection chamber and water seal chamber. Any fluid leaving the client would come down here and raise the level of this volume. It's underwater and typically if we were, I've never seen a single bottle system in my practice. The point of talking about it is the principle of what's going on in the fancy plastic when it's all enclosed. Typically <clears throat> Your straw is always two centimeters into the water. And remember two centimeters because that's the fill line on the complete water seal drainage system. And it's marked right on, you're going to see a slide, it's marked right on the chamber where two centimeters are, where you fill the fluid up. It does make breathing harder as this fluid level rises. So in this system, you would always be raising this straw to where it's always two centimeters below the level of the uh, fluid. Just keep that in mind. Don't fret too much. The water seal chamber is what we're talking about. So that one bottle system had the water seal and drainage collection. On our system that I 
showed you by the document camera and that we had there on the slide, this is kind of just a blow-up of that particular part of that middle chamber on that particular brand of the closed water sealed drainage system. Now, is this client on a ventilator? This client just has a chest tube. They're going to be respirating normal. They're going to inhale and exhale normally. What do you think happens to this fluid level over here where it says zero when they inhale? Does it go up or down? When we inhale, we create a negative pressure. So you're absolutely right. It titles. What's a tide? It's a laundry detergent. That's not a tide. That is tide. What is a tide? That's the water level, right? Tides come in and come out when we have liquid in the water. So titling is this up and down motion. So with negative pressure, it's drawn to the client. Remember, the client's over here. And it falls during passive exhalation. So it rises and falls in that little tube part. Yeah, up and down a little bit. That's expected. If the client was put on a ventilator and we pushed air into their lungs to open it up, and yes, people can have a chest tube and be on a ventilator, now what's going to happen? It's the opposite, okay? So remember one and realize the, depending on how the client's breathing, is the opposite. However you want to know that. Why is that important? All I can tell you is you're going to be really smart about this in a couple of weeks because you're going to be tested. You're going to be really smart about it on the final. But two years after practice, you're going to get your first client with a chest tube and you're going to forget everything, how it works. That's what I see in clinical practice all the time. The nurses forget how this thing works. And so they don't know what's normal and not normal when they're looking at it, when they're assessing this equipment to see if it's working right. So I want you to kind of remember what is right so that you recognize something that's abnormal that you've got to either do something about or call someone about. Can you say that again? It's normal. Which one? I was born? Yeah, yeah. It's hard because they're respirating normally on their own. Okay. We breathe by negative pressure, and that's going to draw the fluid back to the client, which is in that direction. So it rises with inspiration, normal respiration. It falls with normal expiration. And it's the opposite if they're put on a positive pressure ventilator. So it rises with inspiration, falls with expiration, opposite on the ventilator. A positive pressure ventilator. That's significant later on. Should there be any bubbling? Well, look at this. This is kind of pretty. They have little bubbles right there. Should there be any bubbling in the water seal chamber? Stay with me. It depends. When you put in a brand new chest tube with a client that has air in the plural space, and we apply a vacuum, are we going to be drawing the air out of the client? Yes. Will the air bubble through here? Yes. Here's where air in there is abnormal. It's abnormal. You make your 7 a.m. assessment, and there's no bubbling in that chamber. Two hours later, you come in, and there's bubbling in that chamber. Now you've got to investigate. Because once the air is out of the plural space, and the lung is re-expanded, more air in that space, something's changed. It could be no big deal or a very big deal. So the answer about bubbling in there, brand new chest tube, yes. But once it goes away, if it comes back, we've got to investigate it, find out why it's back. There can be an air leak in the system. And if air is leaking into the system towards the client, then it can be drawing air in, and that causes more air, and that will cause air bubbling in that particular chamber. This is a two-bottle system, and I had been a nurse a year or two, and I had a surgeon that I worked with, a general surgeon, and every time I got a patient from him and I worked in the ICU, he would send his patients to the ICU with two bottles. 
And being a new nurse, you know, you don't want to confront the doctor. It wasn't confrontational. I wanted to learn. Doctor, doctor, why, when we have fancy plastic all-in-one, are you sending me patients with glass bottles? And he was older than me because I was really young at the time. And he was very nice. He said, I was in the Air Force. And he said, you know what, those, fan those new, those Provax, wonderful. He goes, but when we go to war, we're going to run out of those. And the nurses need to know how to take care of patients with these bottles. And I'll tell you right now, I hope everyone in this room goes on a medical mission. And if you go on a medical mission, you know what, you may have bottles. And not the fancy stuff that you have at the fancy hospital in the big city. So the principal, I, I, I was thinking, my, his patients are getting inferior care. No, they're not. It's exactly the same principle. It's not inferior. It's just bottles versus the plastic, all-encompassing. And those bottles can be sent back to, can be used again because they're going to be re-sterilized for the next patient. Does that make sense? So I said, no problem. I love working with bottles. Give me more. <laughs> the problem with the glass bottles is they break. That's why I didn't like the bottles. And they don't have the fancy stand. And so they're on the, on the floor at the bottom of the bed. And you're standing at the bed and kicking them. Other than that, they're perfect. <laughs> the third chamber is the suction control chamber. And this is the one that messes up practicing RNs the most. They don't really understand. They forgot the name, because if you remember the name, you'll know what this chamber does. What does it do? Control the suction. Where does it control the suction? And the little holes that are on that chest tube inside the client's body so you don't suck lung tissue out? Is that graphic enough? There are holes, and they're fairly large, and lung tissue is not the strongest tissue in the world. And this sits between chest wall and lung tissue that's been disrupted already. And that chamber controls the amount of vacuum. It sits way over here, way far away from where this is in the client, and yet it controls the amount of vacuum in these holes. So, I can't tell you the number of times I've seen good nurses thinking the chest tube's not working well, trying to troubleshoot it, and they go over to the dial on the wall where this tubing is connected and turn the dial up, thinking it's going to do something. No. The vacuum is controlled by the volume of fluid in the suction control chamber, not by how high you turn that up on the wall. The amount of vacuum way back to the patient is controlled by the amount of fluid in the suction control chamber, not the wall source. Typically, most commercial typically most uh, commercial products, they the line to fill it up with the fluid says 20 centimeters, or centimeters, however you want to say it, 20 centimeters of water. Okay? So what really happens, what, what it is, the vacuum has to overcome the 20 centimeters of water to apply suction. When the nurse goes over and cranks this up, all that happens is more air is drawn in from the environment, and it bubbles like crazy versus the gentle bubbling, which is supposed to happen when it is functioning appropriately. And what happens when it bubbles vigorously, because the wall vacuum is too high, is it all evaporates. And this level gets lower and lower and lower because it's all bubbly. It's like sparkling water, and it all, it all evaporates faster. If the water is lower, does that cause high? If the water le uh, fluid level, water level in the suction control chamber is less than 20, you get less suction at the client. So essentially, you just made it worse. You may not have enough vacuum or suction to keep the lung expanded. 
many times clients are um, they're very, very sick clients, typically clients with cancer, their problem is due to neoplasms, they need a higher level of vacuum to keep the lung expanded. And so they'll use other systems to have that higher vacuum, that higher suction. And if you noticed, back on that slide that had the dry unit, it had a 30 slot. It had a 40 slot. So you get 40, the equivalent of 40 centimeters of water pressure, negative pressure, for vacuum. Dry, oh, no, no, not on here. Dry, same three chambers. When, what the noise you hear when you walk into the client's room is that bubbling in the suction control chamber. Well, dry unit obviously doesn't have that. You don't have to keep the water level at the right level. There's no evaporation. We may see these more. I'm going to guess they're more expensive. Uh, they are appropriate for clients that need, excuse me, higher levels of uh, pressure. What's our responsibility as a nurse? Well, let's talk first. Help me. Tell me what you're, what's unclear. When will we have to fill the chambers? Well, we're gonna get that's part of setting it up, and we're not going to do this in the uh, in the lab, to practice, and you should not be in a position where you have to do it first time, first week of of being a nurse on the floor. That's not realistic. But there will be that time when you are the nurse, and it has to happen, and maybe you've never ever done it before. And it's so easy because you follow the directions. It says that you get a bottle with sterile water, and it says put in 30 mLs here. And what are you going to do? Put in 30 mLs. So follow the directions on how to fill those different, those two, you fill two chambers. The water seal chamber to a certain level, and the suction control chamber to a certain level, and the directions are right in the package. Because I remember the first time I didn't have someone around. I've been a nurse for a couple of years, and I said, oh, 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 I'll read. I'll read. Because, you know, it, you're, you're in a hurry, but it's not, the doctor has to get the chest tube in before you, before you attach this. So while they're getting the chest tube in, you're making sure this is ready. Okay? Helen, you had a question? Yeah. That means the way I understand, I don't know, I could be wrong. We expect to see bubbles on the suction control, but not on the water seal. Okay, I'll repeat that. Brand new chest tube. There's air in the pleural space. Bubbles in two of the three chambers. Water seal and suction control. If it's hooked up to wall suction. And I say if because before, usually before you take the chest tube out, they put the chest tube strictly to gravity. We're not using a wall suction. Same piece of equipment. We just turn this thing off or unplug it from the wall suction. This is going to the client, right? And we just take this and turn it off. That's gravity. Same system, we're just using gravity. We're using the vacuum because well, before we can take this out, the line has to stay expanded, right? So removing the vacuum, the negative pressure, will indicate to us, with the chest ray the next day, we'll say, oh yeah, client went through the night, chest, the lung didn't re-collapse, and we don't have any suction on it. Okay? So there would be no bubbling if you took it off the wall. Yes, ma'am. I have a question that you mentioned earlier. What is the suction of the sealer? Um, so the question was, and I purposely, thank you, we didn't have anything planned ahead of time. Uh, I didn't describe sub-Q emphysema the first few times I mentioned it. I, it may come up, but I'll tell you now. No, it is going to come up. Can you wait until it comes up? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, good, good, good. It's going to come up. Well, what's our responsibilities? Um, we're going to assist. We'll make sure the client's in the right position. Typically, if I'm going to put a chest tube, or not me again, if the doctor's going to put a chest tube on their uh, right side, then I'm going to position them. On their left side, with this side up and exposed, uppermost, so they, the, the physician has access to second intercostal space, fourth or fifth intercostal space, wherever they're going to put this chest tube in. Okay? Uh, we'll open up the sterile trays. 
Remember, the, the, the person putting this in is going to become operating room type sterile. You're the assistant, so you're the ones that are going to be handing them things and such. When you open the trays, once you give them the sterile package, then they're going to be responsible for doing everything else within that sterile tray. Uh, we will have sterile guns for ourselves because they are working on the chest tube. We'll take the end of that chest tube, and when it's time to make the connection, connect it to the, to the uh, water seal drainage system when that occurs. Uh, maybe put on the occlusive dressing, the petroleum gauze, turn on the suction, tape all the connections, obtain uh, that x-ray. Um, kind of what we want to do, things that we can do as, as the nurse working with the, uh, with the uh, provider. Uh, coiling the tubing on the bed. What does that actually mean? Let me show you coiling. <clears throat> what you're trying to prevent is dependent loops. And we're going to do two things. Here's my, here's my chest tube that's, that's below chest level. So it's hanging on the bed frame or it's on the floor. Just like a fully catheter, you don't raise this thing up because where's things going? Back to the client, right? So here is the tubing, and it's very long, and we don't want what they call dependent loops. Even though I'm not using gravity here, do you see how that's a dependent loop? If the client was up here, this would be a dependent loop, right? And so what we try to do when the client's in bed is take the excess tubing and just coil it like that. Okay, kind of get rid of the when you, when you have excess. You don't cut this. <laughs> and this is where and, and we, we have been told in the past to use, uh, and I've seen people do it, and they still may, safety pins to keep these in the bed. So tape it to the, or, or, or safety pin to the sheet. Mm -hmm. They'll put a piece of adhesive tape over here, so they have a tag, and they'll put the safety pin through the tag to the sheet. I've seen it with ND tubes, I've seen it with this kind of stuff, okay? When you have that bubbling that reoccurs, that's the first thing I look for, because if you pierce this tubing, do you see now how I'm, the air leak is not up to the patient, it's from the, air, from the disruption and the integrity of this tubing. This is very soft and flexible. Uh, also, this connection can be, become, we, we really uh, tie this or take this down really, really well, but it could come loose, and this could become disconnected, okay? That's what we mean by coiling. Here's the, the big picture. Here's the big, this is exactly in your book, right? Yes. So there's nothing. Now, they have the manufacturer of this system that is just the opposite of the one I showed you. Because the drainage collection chamber is on the left side versus the right side. But the water seal still remains in the middle, and the section control chamber with 20 centimeters of water at that level is on the other side. It's just the mirror image of the device I have in my possession. And that one over there, the top little tube, is the one that goes to the wall section if you already use it. That's correct. And that's, that's, that is this tube right here. And I know the picture's in the way, and what that says is to the suction source, or air, and air means you don't, you don't take it anywhere. It's just open to the environment. How long would you leave it on the, on the wall suction? You leave it on the wall suction until the client's recovering. And you wouldn't take it off the wall suction unless you have a problem, right. and then you call the doctor. So uh, the decision is, it's been long enough, chest x-rays look good, the decision is to put on, on gravity drainage, and then usually 24 hours after they've been on gravity drainage, it comes out the next day. That's what it'll say, a DC to gravity drainage or something. For now, that's right. That's what it is. Right. 
Okay, so we got a, this is kind of nice because it shows you where the chest tube is inside the, inside the, physically inside the client. I told you yesterday, and if I didn't, I meant to, I always want you, you will greatly improve your nursing skills if you really and truly understand when something enters the body, where in the heck is the other side? And what's it supposed to do? We want to know, we need to know what it's supposed to do so we can identify and troubleshoot when it's not doing what it's supposed to. Um, nursing care after insertion. Test tube is put in. Uh, we assess the following, the client's respiratory status. Uh, we get a full set of vital signs. To me, I believe vital signs include pulse, BP, respirations, temperature, pain, right, and O2 sac. That's what I think a full set of vital signs are. If you're on a unit where you can't get an O2 sac, well, then you can't get it. Well, we know that we have five vital signs, right? So we need to assess that. Don't, what do we, is, if I told you their blood pressure, the client's blood pressure is 120 over 80, would you say good or bad? The answer is, I don't know. What was it before? Any number for vital signs in isolation does you no good. So take that as a hint. <laughs> God, I tell my students, you come and give me a set of vital signs, I go, what else? What else is the vital signs? I said, I understand, but that doesn't help me to know whether, because if their blood pressure is normally, they walk around every day of their life, 90 over 60, is once when you're already good? No, they're hypertensive for that client. Okay? So I like vital signs to say, in the last eight hours, their blood pressure, their pulses range from 84 to 102. Their blood pressure has been 70, I'm sorry, uh, okay, 78 to uh, 110 over 58 to 80. And versa versa. That gives us a better picture on the client's status currently, doesn't it? I'm saying this because you should have pre-vital signs before they put the test tube in and post-vital signs. And we expect pulse to go down, blood pressure to go down, uh, respirations to go down. O2 sat to improve. Pain may go up, but the other vital signs seem to improve. You need to be descriptive. If it's bloody drainage, it's sanguinous, right? If it's pinkish, it can be serous sanguinous. If it's serous, it's serous. If it's pussy, it's yellow and green and gross looking. Okay, so we got to be uh, descriptive in our... I always tell students, if there's something coming out of the client's body for drainage, I need to be, you need to be descriptive. How much? What it looks like? Clear or cloudy? And if there's an odor, what is the odor associated with it? Uh, chest tube, some risk and complications. Uh, bleeding, because we've entered the client's body, there's always a chance of bleeding. Infection. And subacute emphysema. Give me that term again. Uh, you know, let's talk about bleeding. Can we accidentally, not we, the physician, no, they're gone, it's our client, lacerate accidentally a vessel? When we're putting this chest tube in? Yes. Uh, the client is at greater risk for infection the longer the chest tube's in place. Subcute emphysema is exactly what it sounds, sounds like. It is air that is collected in the subcutaneous tissue. Where does air want to go? Up. Correct? I remember my first client, early in my nursing career, we put a, we, the doctor put in a trach, a trach, and I was in the ICU when this was occurring. Very quickly and very rapidly, the person's neck went like this. I thought I was on a, in a movie, and the guy was transforming into something. But air had started leaking in the sub-Q tissue 
and it just made his, it distended, because this tissue is very stretchy, right? So it got very big. So Q emphysema, I want you to imagine putting Rice Krispies on your countertop, putting Saran Wrap over the Rice Krispies, and rubbing your hands and touching the Rice Krispies. That is not, not squishing them, <laughs> but touching them and how they feel. And that's what sub-Q emphysema feels like. It is actually air that's leaking and trying to escape through the skin. So can you see how I have a chest tube entering in and air could become trapped in the subcutaneous tissue around that insertion site? What do we do about it? We watch it. We note it. And we determine whether it's getting worse or not worse. Uh, we actually traumatize lung tissue itself, and we know a fistula is an opening between two separate organs or pieces of tissue that shouldn't be there. And so a, a, we have a foreign object in some space, and if it, can it cause necrosis to the tissue around that? Because it's, it's creating some pressure. So it could cause a, a fistula to occur between the uh, lung tissue and the pleural pleura. Let me, um, let me ask a question. I know what the answer is probably. Do we want a short break? Or do we want to go for 15, 20 minutes and be done? 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. Be done. Be done. We vote in here. How about Finish this? Keep going. I can go there. <laughs> okay. Just push it. Okay, we're going to keep going. And, I, and I'm not going to slow down. But I want to make sure you get the full lecture, right? I know all the information you need. So when we're done, if you want to come up here and touch things, I haven't showed Chester, because I do have, let me show you something, that I haven't shown the, uh, the uh, oops. Mm. Oh! I don't know if the visuals help or the audio stuff helps. Let me, let me go over this right now, and uh, let me zoom in a little bit. Oh, that's all it goes. This is our chest tube mannequin. Um, I can set it up in the, in the lab. Uh, Dr. Vicks, we can come and borrow it and take it down to Schoenberg later on, if that's what we need to do. Uh, I will walk over to it right now and talk about it a little bit, but you really will need to come up and actually... So you can visually see the anatomy and where the chest tube actually goes. This is kind of show you the normal rib structure under the pectoral muscle, obviously on the right chest here, and you can visually see the lung tissue uh, underneath this. Um, this is kind of showing you where the how far the ribs go when someone's in the fourth or fifth or sixth intercostal space mid axillary how they're gaining access. And then actually over here, this is something that they would use in ACLS, Advanced Trauma Life Support, or ACLS, and they actually have a mechanism. This is puncturable to do that pinching pneumothorax intervention. Okay. And yes, I think you do get the sound. And then actually over here, is uh, a way to have the chest tube inside the client. Um, and there's some neat things that we can do. It's just, you know, if we had more time for a simulation lab, we would set this up. And uh, I have set up mannequins before in Simman and, uh, and done some more things. But this kind of shows you more of the anatomy and stuff on where this actually is. So if you want to, after this lecture, you can come up and look at that. Okay. What we have is documentation uh, after insertion of the, uh, what are our responsibilities? Well, obviously our highest priority 
after safety is ABCs, airway breathing, so we are really focused on the client's respiratory status. If they were dyspneic, short of breath, um, rapid respirations, don't we want to see them? We, we want to see the improvement, the change. Uh, Bottom signs before and after we talk about that. We need to know who put it in. Dr. So-and-so. Don't tell us housekeeping. <coughs> Dr. So-and-so. We need to know what size the chest tube is, where it was inserted on the body. What's missing from there is to how far on what marking on the chest tube itself. Uh, you're marking centimeters, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 10 uh, 14, 16. We would say uh, 14 centimeters. Whatever's sticking out, the first mark that we see sticking out of the body is what we're documenting. Does that make sense? Because we always need to follow up one hour later, two hours later, the next day. Has it been pushed in further? Not on purpose. Or has it been accidentally removed some? They are sutured in place. There will be black suture surrounding this outside the client's body and actually sewn into the client's skin. But if you've ever seen one, someone take out a huge inflated balloon from their bladder, they can actually get this caught on something and, 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 and rip the skin and pull this out some. Yeah. And you, you think, oh my gosh, that has to hurt. It's amazing how, because a client with, with multiple issues or has so much pain going on all the time already, that's, that, that didn't hurt anything worse that's going on with them. So they not, may not know. We're going to document the amount of suction. And remember that equals typically 20 centimeters of water. Fluctuation. Do we have normal titling up and down? in the water seal chamber, and then record the, the type and the amount of drainage in the drainage collection chamber. <laughs> now, I already talked about for drainage, color, clarity, and another thing that's missing there is the insertion site. Remember, it's got a... But what I want to... Uh, you're right, you're right, you're right. Thank you. What I want to add, because what I said is where, what I need to add is we need to observe the dressing. And what you'll see is nothing but tape. Because there's petroleum gauze right around the tube into where it enters the body. And over that is 4 by 4s And over that is a lot of tape. So basically, we want to look for any drainage or odor from that insertion site. How often do they have to change this dressing? They typically will not change this dressing. Until they take out the dressing? Correct. Okay. Typically. Okay. So do you put the same type of dressing on it and it just do, like, comes out if they accidentally pull it out? Just put the same petroleum? Good question. Are you talking about chest tube in the bed? Yeah, like it's completely out. Chest tube in the bed, we've got our assess we've got our Typically, you put an inclusive dressing. What, what the medics learn during wartime on a sucking chest wound is the, the person's ID card goes over the top of that. A plastic, like, think of your driver's license. Because remember, they're sucking air in and not getting air out. So you put in, a clue, in the hospital, ideally you have petroleum gauze to put over that uh, to make an occlusive dressing. I've seen saran wrap put over, okay, plastic wrap. Uh, we're about to lose some people. I need to pause to call the number. <laughs> <laughs> I got my five-minute warning. So, and so you see what I mean? If it's if it's if it's if it falls out, you got to have an inclusive dress. But the problem with me making it completely inclusive. Tension pneumothorax. So a lot of times you put saran wrap on, tape it on three sides, leave one side open so air can escape. Yeah. Are y'all going? Are y'all going? Everyone leaving? No. Yeah. We're, we're swapping. Nothing bad.
battery I'm afraid that if, the, if we lose connection, Schulenberg and conference room, that means they're going to have to call a break. And they're not answering the phone, so. Mr. Hutton, while we wait for this, just a reminder, if you're going to go to the new board ICU at College Station Medical Center, the orientation is tomorrow. Full uniform, 9 a.m. at the lobby. Dr. Bixler? Yes, sir. Who in, and Brian, would that pertain to? I think there's about nine students in the Bryant area that are going to College Station Medical Center. Is that for OB or P's? It's for P. That's the first time. That's the first time. I don't know anything about that, and we'll try to find out. Do they know who they are? No. Uh, you know who they are? Yes, I do. Oh, I will. Let me begin my list. I didn't bring it this time. We're back in the show. Well, I'm not there. I'm not going to I guess I heard that. <laughs> nah, whatever. Dr. Bixler, are you going to let us know who we are? She is going to get her list from her office. She will be right back. Thank you, Tammy. I apologize for that screen saying it's going to take place. I was trying to get you. I want to go home, too. Let me go find the people because I couldn't get them on the phone. If we lose connections, you can take a break. And by the time you come back, hopefully everything's back up, okay? I apologize. I
you know anything about what people have stuff tomorrow? I don't have any Brandy? Yeah. 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 I even have a lot of Yeah, it's an emergency. Right, try. Yeah, this one was like a good one. Yeah, this one was like a good one. Yeah, this one was like a good one. I called the office, and there's no one in 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 the office, and it's closed. Office also. You can't hear me, I'll pay you, John Margine, but I just wanted to...